So um, again, welcome everybody. And I am uh, Arn van Alstafjord, and I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. And welcome to our KCS Aligned and Verified Vendor Series. So in this series, you get to hear KCS best practices uh, from experts from our aligned and verified vendors and their community. And for those not familiar with our KCS Aligned and Verified program, it's an elite group of tools that support the KCS practices. So in the case of our verified vendors, they've demonstrated that they support all eight KCS practices. And our line vendors are more specialized. So they've proven that they support elements of the KCS methodology. So uh, in this webinar, uh, this is sponsored by Upland Right Answers. So they are one of our KCS v6 verified vendors. And I'm pleased to introduce Michelle Stump. So Michelle is the KCS practice director and is a KCS certified trainer. So today, Michelle will lead a panel of seasoned practitioners and I'll let Michelle introduce all these great practitioners. And they're gonna discuss some of the biggest challenges and uh, how to set yourself up for success with your KCS implementation. Um, but some housekeeping before we begin, uh, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the KCS Academy site as well as sent out to all who have registered. So, um, and just some how we're gonna operate, uh, please post your questions in chat. So um, make sure you're on mute until the end for the Q&A, but we'll be monitoring the chat and um, we'll either, Michelle will be the key monitor of that. She'll either answer them in chat, bring them up um, to the panel as appropriate in the flow or save them for the Q&A session at the end, depending on the question. And, um, but also wanna make sure you are aware of upcoming KCS Academy events. So next Tuesday, we're gonna have a KCS in Action webinar covering coaching. And again, it's gonna be similar to this where we're gonna have a, a panel of experts. So I'm gonna host Monique Cabina, Christy Morin and Jason O'Donnell. And they're gonna discuss their coaching programs, um, tips to get started, ditches to avoid and how to measure and sell the value. And they, uh, what's nice is as we've been going through kind of prepping for it, they each implemented coaching differently. So you get a broad perspective on the options. And uh, I think that's very, very cool because as uh, with KCS, there is so many different options to how you implement. Um, and then in December, Reggie Adams and Richie Amicio from ADP um, will discuss how they've leveraged Scrum and Agile in their KCS program. And it's not only for the tools and features typical for a, a Scrum and Agile, but they've actually leveraged that for their entire KCS methodology deployment. So uh, get to hear about how they did that, the successes and things that they learned along the way. And Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager, is going to post a link in the chat for those events. And it's always great to hear about uh, the digital transformations. And I have a broad digital transformations, whether it be KCS, intelligence swarming, community, whatever the case might be. Um, and whether it's your successes, strategies and tips, as well as ditches you've encountered and how to avoid them. So if you'd like to present at a KCS in action, please reach out to me and I'll get you on the calendar and I'll post my contact information in chat. But I'm uh, very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Michelle and her esteemed panel. Excellent, Arthur. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to the consortium and the academy here for really having us. And, um, you know, just one of the things in terms of talking about PCS, it's, it's what, you know, we all do all day, every day for the most part. And, you know, we're still excited to really talk about it. And and really being those true knowledge <laughs> knowledge management people that we are, where we live and breathe knowledge, you know, we like to really get together and, and share what we've learned with others, really just kind of, you know, <laughs> walking the walk, if you will. Um, so, you know, as a KCS certified trainer, you know, like I mentioned, we work day in and day out with companies when they're either implementing KCS or looking to maybe reinvigorate um, what they've already established with KCS, or maybe they didn't quite get it up off the ground, right? Um, so, you know, personally, I'm always sharing experience that I and other KCS practitioners have had so that companies can really build upon that knowledge, not fall into those ditches that Arn Finn just mentioned. Um, that's, that's really always my goal is, is don't do this and, and here's why, here's what's happened. So, you know, always aiming to get companies to be able to successfully implement KCS. 
So today really wanted to expand on some of these discussions that I have one-on-one -on -one with companies and really bring in a few of my favorite KCS practitioners that I've had the opportunity to work with so that they can share those experiences directly with all of you. So I've got some really great topics here lined up um, that we're really excited to talk about. And whether we're talking about implementing something for the first time, um, you know, what challenges come upon us, right? So sustaining KCS, making sure we have that buy-in, you know, it's really, you know, all of these different topics that help us, you know, as we start thinking about, you know, what we're looking to roll out, we want to make sure that we have all of the different pieces to the puzzle, if you will, in alignment and, you know, making sure we don't fall into any of those ditches. Um, so, you know, I wanted to take a moment and have my panel um, jump in here and, and introduce themselves um, as they are, you know, just a panel of, of the experts in the KCS field here. <laughs> so, um, guys, I'll, I'll introduce you one at a time if you'd like to jump in and introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your background, um, what companies you work for and your role there. That would be perfect. So um, first up here is going to be Liz Bunger. And Liz, I've known for a very long time here, and she is the program manager, business program manager for knowledge over at Paycheck. So Liz just wanted to turn it over to you for a minute and let you introduce yourself. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, yes, I am the program manager for our knowledge program at Paychex in our service organization. And I've been involved with our knowledge program for the 14, 14 years that we have been following KCS. I was actually one of the people on the service desk that said, how could you do this to me? I don't have time for one more thing. So I've been in a, quite a few different roles when it comes to knowledge. I moved from there into a coach and then oversaw our knowledge program and our IT service desk. And we've since expanded it. So it's really an enterprise knowledge program, KCS program. And now I oversee it for our about 8,000 person service organization. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Liz. Thanks so much. Great to have you here. And next up is, is Jacob Watts, and he's the Director of Knowledge Center Service at PAR Technologies. And, and Jacob and I have known each other for, wow, quite a few years uh, now, having met at one of the KCS events uh, years ago, I think one of the member summits way back then. So um, Jacob wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so I'm currently working with PAR Technologies. I joined PAR uh, just over six months ago. We um, uh, develop and support technology for the restaurant industry, which which is uh, a whole new thing for me. Uh, previously, I worked for Sienna, Red Hat, and Cisco WebEx, and so I've managed multiple KCS implementations, and uh, I've seen a variety of challenges along the way. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jacob. So glad you could join us here today. And let's but not least is Cheryl Wickwire, and she's a part owner of knowledge management at Arrow Electronics. And Cheryl and I go back several years uh, mm -hmm this point, having rolled out um, KCS at a previous organization she was with, Point Click Care. Many of you, um, if you were with us in Seattle, may remember um, where Cheryl and I presented. It was quite a few years ago now, right, Cheryl? Yes. Um, yes. I'm going to give you an, an, uh, an opportunity to introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Michelle. Super excited to be here. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I am at Aero uh, Electronics uh, currently. I've been there for a whole month and a half. Um, but uh, real excited to uh, be working on their uh, rollout of KCS. Uh, they're just currently in the process of rolling it out to um, their IT, which is around 1,500 people. So this is, this is really exciting. Um, and as Michelle mentioned, um, uh, also that I used to work at Point Click Care and um, w w had... <coughs> excuse me, had great success with uh, KCS there, started out in the customer support team and started rolling it out to other departments and even ended up um, implementing a, a successful self-service to our customers. So um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Um, so just a little bit about the format um, for the rest of our, our session for today. So, you know, we've got a lot of great topics that we want to talk about here and some questions surrounding each one, of course. Um, so what I'm really going to do is, is introduce the question and give each one of our panelists the opportunity to really share their response for each one. Um, so, you know, first um, one we're going to dive into, and Liz, I'm going to start with you on this one, um, is really we're, we're diving into the deep end here, so apologies in, in advance, is really talking about challenges, right? And, you know, looking at, you know, just getting a sense for, you know, if you could pick one particular challenge that has been your toughest challenge to date, 
you know, what has that challenge been and how did you really work to overcome that? So um, I'll start with you, Liz, first. Um, so floor is yours. Thanks, Michelle. Um, the biggest challenge that we had when implementing that I think is a continuous challenge is buy-in. And it's buy-in at all levels and getting people to understand what KCS really means. Um, I, I think what I found is everybody believes that knowledge is a good idea, but sure, of course, we want a place for our people to go and get answers to their questions, but getting them to understand what that really means, <clears throat> excuse me, and what it takes. And it's not the same message for every audience. But it's, you know, to get the executives to buy in, it's a different message than it is to get your front level folks to buy in because they have different priorities and different things are important to them. What I found is um, lots of times people think knowledge is great. Absolutely, we want to do this. And then they expect the knowledge fairies to show up and they're just going to populate all of the information into the knowledge base and everybody's just going to magically use it. And it's, it's not magic. It's not field of dreams. If you build it, they will not come. It takes care and it takes feeding and it, it takes a culture behind it. It's not just a tool implementation. There needs to be an entire culture behind it. So absolutely buy-in is the biggest challenge, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I would have to say buy-in is one of the, the conversations I have day in and day out, um, you know, with organizations really spanning regardless of where they are, um, whether they're starting out or whether they're, they're in phase two or phase three, it's really what we're looking to do to, to not only make sure we've got it, but how do we maintain it? And I love what you said about field of dreams, right? If, if they build it, they will come. Um, yeah, it, it does not work. I say that over and over again. And they're like, but it work here. Our order is <laughs> different, right? And I'm sure you've heard that, right? It's, mm -hmm. We're so starved for this. It's absolutely going to. If I could Piggyback off of Liz's comments there. Yeah, um, talking about getting that buy-in, one of the challenges that I've run into, and, and uh, I've seen a couple of extremes, are the hidden dimensions. And I've actually had a couple of situations where leaders on the surface presented that they were supportive of the program uh, when in fact they weren't. And that can be a real challenge because um, you, you know I, I'm a big fan of the KCS principles and I, I trust by default. But I also believe in the expression, you know, trust but verify. If you're seeing the evidence that adoption is not taking off, um, it's worth an investigation and getting closer to that team. In, in one extreme situation, I had a manager, again, you know, presented that he was supportive of the program and I asked for a coach and he gave me a coach. And a few weeks later, the coach told me that he was told by his manager, oh, don't waste your time on that knowledge based stuff. <laughs> so um, it's it's hard it's hard to to gauge that, but that's something to to be aware of is that sometimes people will play the game of politics. I unfortunately, I've seen that as as well. And you know, it's it's just a couple of weeks ago, I actually had this conversation where I said, you know, there may be something political in the background here. Um, ultimately, they're telling you there's trust. Um, you know, getting into one of those core principles. And I like what you said regarding, you know, sticking to them and, and, and really trusting and then looking for that evidence, right? And I said, you know, they're, they're saying that they trust people, but in reality, the way that everything has been set up and everything they're saying is actually running counter to that. So, you know, where is that, you know, is there actually that trust? Is there something that, that's political that, that's actually happening? Um, I've personally seen organizations you know, be really successful at KCS to the point of rolling out self-service. And then at that point got to be very, very political where, you know, the people running KCS and everybody involved with that was out of their hands, no longer, you know, just able for them to continue driving it forward and ultimately ended up failing as a result um, because of the politics in, in the background. And, um, you know, unfortunately that's, that's something we don't want to see happen. Of course, we're putting our heart and soul into everything that we're doing with KCS. It's not a great path. Um, to really go down. Yeah, and I think it, I think it um, emphasizes the importance of executive sponsorship and, and establishing a strategic framework. So when you've got that strong executive sponsor who's really vocal, it helps to mitigate um, uh, potentially people that have other interests because that begins to bring KCS into the forefront. Yeah, and I, I love that you mentioned the strategic framework piece, and, and Cheryl's probably going to know <laughs> what I'm going to say here. Um, one of the things I always beg customers to do, and, and even through training, people have heard me say it, you know, if there's one thing that you're going to think that you can skip with the strategic framework, um, you know, please heed my word of caution, do not do this, right? So in terms of, 
you know, really making sure that we have that, that understanding with our executive sponsor that they understand and can speak to everything that, you know, KCS brings to the table in terms of us meeting all of our goals, but then also in terms of executive turnover as well. It's, I know that's another common challenge that organizations have, you know, once they have that executive turnover, then it becomes help. How do we stop KCS from, you know, kind of deteriorating because our new executive sponsor really isn't on, on board. We've got to get buy-in. How do we make them understand, right? So, you know, it's it's all of these things, and, and the strategic framework is one of those really important elements to you know to really establish and, and revisit. It just ties into so much. So, um, Shal, I saw you were um, <laughs> shaking your yep. head. I didn't. Yep. Want to I was just going <clears throat> No, uh, you said it beautifully. <clears throat> I was just going to chime in with um, not only um, do I agree with the, with your guys's comments on how it, very important the executive buy-in is is. <clears throat> that it's super important that they communicate it and actually over communicate it is best. The more and more you communicate, the more and more you mention it, the more it's in front of people's minds and that they, they, uh, they get the sense then that it's valued. So that that's key. And it, and it depends. It's, it's carries a lot of clout when it comes from the CEO on down. That is very true. I will tell you um, some of the things when you mentioned CEO, I've had, I've run training sessions where um, we've had, you know, just the executive sponsor and I've had various degrees all the way up from, you know, VP, senior VPs to the CEO jump on first five or 10 minutes of the training session and really talk about how important that was um, and, and what they're doing and, and what they're learning. I will tell you just the energy that comes from that. It really has that trickle down effect you know, starting with that, that first training that they're, you know, this, Hey, this isn't my manager's crazy idea is one of those pieces of feedback I always get afterwards. So really having that, that support in place and, and, you know, really going back to the practices guide where there's such a great, um, there, there are just so, so much great, um, material in the practices guide that if you haven't actually seen like the stakeholder, um, table, which really details out all of the roles and responsibilities, it really helps you to understand what do you need to be doing and who you need to get engaged and what they need to be helping you with essentially here. So um, just a shout out to the practices guide in regards to that. Um, so Cheryl, since, since you had chimed in here, is there any other challenge that um, you could you know, think of that came to mind in terms of being the toughest challenge that you've encountered? Yeah, what I'd like to share is, um, and, and it, it's very similar to what Jacob was saying. You, you get the, yep, yep, we think this is a good idea. Yes, yes, it is. But until you actually put it into the knowledge workers' performance objectives, you're really not going to get any traction on it. Because even though everybody would, would agree with you during the training or would agree with you that, yeah, this is a great idea, really, you know, this, this is good, I'll do this. But unless it's in their performance objectives, um, it might not it it might not um, happen. So what I mean by that is basically what I did again was we went to the to the practice guide, <laughs> took those goals right straight out of out of there of what is a goal for a KCS uh, candidate, a publisher, a coach, a KDE. Took that information, put that into performance objectives also took whatever the company had agreed upon um, for the AQI, the goal for the AQI, put that into their performance objectives too. That way they know that, okay, this is a directive. This is the what, you know, this is how, you know, KCS is how we do our work now. So yes, this is, this is how I do my work now. So just wanted to share that because when, uh, when we actually did that, things started to, um, things started to really go a lot smoother. I like that you incorporate the quality piece as a part of that measurement framework. So it's not just about, you know, pushing buttons, but it's producing good quality content. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, that worked really well. So yeah, great comment um, from Robert in the chat here is that exactly that it must be in the performance objectives, but not the leading indicators, right? So, and that's an area where a lot of organizations you know, truly get stuck is, you know, they, and I say, this is a conversation I literally have every day. And it's usually in the form of, 
please do not put number of articles created in terms of, of the performance objectives here, because that ultimately becomes their focus, right? Is the number of articles. It's not the process. It's not the behavior. Now it's, okay, I need to create five articles per week or even three articles per week or whatever the, you know, the number is the organization has decided on. And that's the wrong focus, right? We want the focus to be bigger than that, right? That's just the, I mean, it's just the activity that leads towards the outcome. What's the outcome? You know, the outcome is obviously having a successful knowledge base that everybody can, can really use. So yeah, I love that, that you called that out. Absolutely. And, you know, also in, in the chat, AQI is critical to any good knowledge base, right? So article quality index, or as it's currently called, the content standard checklist, absolutely, right? It's about that quality of knowledge that people have created. Are they following or adhering to our content standard? Is the article complete? You know, have they, you know, exhausted searching? So they're not searching, they're not actually creating a duplicate article. You know, all of these things are, are super important, absolutely, and, and things that we need to look at. Um, so, Jacob, um, any other challenges that, that you've experienced that you'd like to share here? I think the hidden dimension part was the biggest piece. Um, I, you know, Brad Smith talks often about how KCS is like a 10,000 pound flywheel and, and it takes a whole lot of effort to get that flywheel started. And so the early phases of adoption can be a real challenge, especially when you're introducing KCS to an organization that hasn't experienced it before. And uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I you know, I kind of want to see that instant gratification. And sometimes it just takes a lot of time and a lot of patience and a lot of persistence. And so it becomes really important to celebrate the small wins up front. Um, but it is, you know, in the, in the same sense of a 10,000 pound flywheel, once you've got that initial velocity, um, you know, it, it can it can really get going and, and it, it begins to become a snowball effect. Um, in, in my last implementation, uh, there was a similar situation with a manager who uh, was vocally supportive and his team did not adopt KCS. And, and, and there were some other challenges with adoption um, at play as well uh, in terms of the dynamics between the different product lines um, and the challenges that they were faced with. And so we really had to reassess, put a pause on wave two because wave one had not yet reached the level of success that we needed, and then focused on the product pillar that was having success that wasn't as challenged and bringing the other teams from that product pillar into what we called wave 1.5. Um, and so, you know, being flexible and being able to adjust if things aren't going quite as planned is, I think, important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've seen recently, and it's something that, <laughs> you know, one of those things are, you know, send out that red flag to me was, you know, just a really tight deadline in terms of, you know, what, how their adoption and the different waves were going to going to roll out where there was literally no breathing space at all in between different groups, um, you know, in between getting feedback and, and seeing if we needed to make any updates to the content standard, you know, which could lead towards changes in training. Same thing from a workflow perspective, right? If we're getting valuable feedback. So, you know, I see a lot of unnecessary difficulty there just because of, of some organizations with, you know, how they put those different deadlines in place for the different ways of adoption too. Um, one of the questions that came into chat um, since we were on uh, this topic, just wanted to ask it here. Um, does anybody have any specific outcomes that you're currently using to really um, reinforce the KCS culture in terms of the performance assessment? Is there anything specific that you found to be useful? I think one of the biggest ones for us, um, especially when we first rolled out in our service desk was first contact resolution to see that the increase in the first contact resolution because people were able to find the answers themselves. We also do look at um, client satisfaction and employee satisfaction. And we've seen increases in those in the, in the areas that are heavy users of knowledge. We tend to see higher client satisfaction, higher employee satisfaction. They feel they have the answers that, that the resources, I should say, that they need. Yeah, decrease in, in time to resolution on known cases is a major outcome that we're looking for. 
Um, and the organization, the, our technical support organization is really great about collaborating and that's all done over Slack. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how the volume of those conversations is potentially affected. I expect that the collaboration will still take place over newer issues, but uh, the question makes me wonder if there's a way of measuring um, how much activity is happening in these channels in Slack where engineers are, are communicating amongst each other. There's a lot of conversations you know, that, that repeat themselves and a lot of searches that are taking place. So the Slack is, is you know, so we've, we've just uh, a few weeks ago launched Right Answers internally and we're getting ready to launch uh, wave one of our, our KCS program in a couple of weeks. Our coaches are trained up and they're starting to practice, them, practice amongst each other. Uh, but S Slack in the past has been kind of the default knowledge base. And so I, you know, I don't, I don't know what capabilities are around us, but uh, now that I'm kind of forced to think about it with the question at hand, I wonder if there's a way of measuring how often these channels are hit with searches because that's, that's been the go-to place. Yeah, that's a really, <laughs> that's a really, um, you know, great question to, to put out there, right? And I see a lot of great responses to the chat, including couple things that haven't been mentioned um, by you guys. So looking at, um, and if I missed one of these, I apologize, but looking at, you know, I think case deflection was one thing that we saw, but PAR was another one. And that's, that's one of the things I work with a lot of organizations to make sure that they're, you know, that's the process of adherence review, right? So, you know, how often are people actually taking the opportunities to, to, to actually use the knowledge and the knowledge base to modify, to create, right? Are they actually participating and not just flying on the, under the radar, right, so to speak. So yeah, that's another uh, great one as well. So one thing I'll throw in there when it comes to case deflection, I think is is looking, it's gotta be um, looking at more than just the numbers. So for example, when we first rolled out our internal self-service, so our IT service desk created knowledge that was available to our internal users. Uh, if we look at the number of contacts that were going into knowledge and that were coming to us, it was actually significantly higher. But what we found is we had people who were sitting next to broken equipment that they just didn't have time to contact us about. So they were now resolving issues that they were never bothering to call us about. So looking at those numbers, it looks like it's, it's just higher. We've got a lot more coming in, but they were able to just get a lot more self-service. That, that's a very good point, Liz. Uh, I noticed too, we, we had to do a little digging uh, into the numbers as well because they were deceiving. And then once you found out what they were actually looking at and why, you know, why did these numbers increase? And it was because of those things. They were able to self-serve. So that was huge. Um, and the other, the other thing too that, uh, that I'd like to mention here is just to keep in mind uh, again, when you're looking at numbers and they can be deceiving as far as case deflection goes, um, sometimes you have to look at the nitty gritty detail, meaning people are creatures of habit. So they're used to, I'm going to create a case. Okay, I'm just going to create a case. So what we did was in order to encourage use of the self-services after they've submitted their case, we would, we would uh, uh, send this message. Thank you. We got your case. Uh, by the way, while you're waiting, ha have you looked at our self-service portal? And we've had more than, uh, this was at my previous employer, but we had more often than not where people would um, say, uh, by the way, I, I, found, I found my answer. Please go ahead and close the case. So over time, what happens is they get used to that. And again, that changes your numbers. So sometimes you really need to look in and look at the, the nitty gritty detail of what, what is going on with those numbers. We actually have for them to open a, to self-serve to open an interaction or even do a click to chat with our IT service team, they have to get to that through our knowledge base. It's not mm -hmm. available anywhere else. You have to get into the knowledge base and then you can start that. So at least they're there hopefully doing a search before they submit anything. Yes, ours was the same way. However, uh, we could tell that some of them weren't. They were creatures of habit. Yeah. So they just, even though they were right there, <laughs> they still logged the case first. And then, so, but that, that you just have to help them change their habits. 
Excellent. We could probably talk nonstop all day about all the different challenges, right, <laughs> that we've encountered um, with, you know, implementing and, and sustaining KCS, but I want to get to some of our other topics here. And, you know, really, you know, touching upon, and I know we've touched upon some of the core concepts and principles already um, with KCS, but, you know, in thinking about, you know, as you implemented this or reinvigorated this or kept it going, really, you know, was there any specific, whether it was a practice or a principle that you didn't adhere to, but wish you had? And, and why, really? What, what happened? What was the result? So um, kind of wanted to, you know, just open that up, see if anybody wanted to jump in on, on that particular question there. I know I have several here that I've personally encountered, but wanted to hear from you guys. I'll, uh, I'll talk about one. <laughs> the do not put goals on activities. That is really, really important. Just want to throw that out there. Um, we had a discussion when we first started practicing KCS. Um, and, and as you know, in, in the support world, you're very numbers oriented. You're always looking at, at, at the, the numbers. And so the link rate popped out and everybody wanted to use you know, our frontline managers, we all think, you know, we really need to use that link rate because we want to, to uh, encourage this type of behavior. Well, unfortunately, we did use the link rate and found out it, it, it did backfire on us. We had, um, in order to make that number, they were attaching an article, even if it didn't relate to what, what the case was about. So, you know, people will do whatever it takes to, to make that goal. So again, do not put goals on activities because then what you have is you have a bunch of junk, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, uh, being linked to your cases. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I think all of us uh, at some point, if you've been around knowledge management long enough, have seen an implementation where <laughs> metrics were set. And I think there's a, a distinct difference between goals, which is this is what we're seeking to achieve versus a hard metric, which is you're going to achieve this or we're going to dock your pay or penalize you in some sense. So, um, you know, it's a really challenging situation because people thrive off of goals and, and you have to have something that's out there. But part of it is in how you communicate those numbers and where they come into play. I would say that one of my bigger regrets in a previous implementation was trying to perfect the solve loop and adoption of KCS before implementing knowledge domain analysis and setting the bar too high. So the expression that many of you have heard is, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. You certainly need to achieve a certain level of maturity in your KCS implementation. You need to reach a certain uh, volume of content and you need to have uh, a reasonably good reuse rate and more importantly, um, attach rate ac or attach accuracy. Uh, but knowledge domain analysis is where you get some of the key benefits of KCS. And if uh, you set the bar too high in, in terms of what adoption of the solve loop looks like before moving on to that step, then you'll never realize those benefits. And I think it's okay to dip the toe, your toes in the water of knowledge domain analysis and start small and then generate some successes and, and build off of there. Uh, but you can get some really profound benefits. And, and in fact, some of the engineers will naturally gravitate towards uh, KDE activities like development of resolution path articles, or uh, just yesterday in, in Right Answers, I'll throw a plug in there, we were uh, working with a couple of engineers on developing a decision tree, which is which is one of the you know really rich capabilities that exists within Right Answers. And there are a lot of uh, situations like uh, the the register, it, uh, you know, the display of the register is black, and you know why is it it's not powering on? Why is it not powering on? There's a hundred different root causes of that, and so building out that uh, decision tree capability, which is inherently a KDE activity, uh, we haven't even launched Wave One, and we've got engineers that are already trying to develop um, what is content that would normally fall under the umbrella of knowledge domain analysis. I love that. <laughs> 
my right answers hat right now and, and I'm a big uh, promoter of those decision trees. So I, I love hearing that too. So thank you for kind of a shameless plug there. I, I saw that Kelly put a link to the do not put goals on activities mug in the chat. So I couldn't help but pull that up. Um, you know, I love the great um, KCS swag that that is out here it truly is when you think about it. Um, just a, a really great reminder. <laughs> Sometimes we need to pull that into, you know, just our planning, right, in terms of, uh, you know, getting people to kind of live and breathe the things that we do on a day to day basis. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention here too, and, and to the panel, feel free to jump in if, if there's any other ones that come to mind. The one that I see most common, or I should say the two, right, um, and believe it or not, trust, right, and I know Jacob and, and Liz and, and Cheryl, we touched upon this one earlier, is that you know, we have this concept where people say, yes, we trust people, but then as they're implementing or rolling out the knowledge base, every decision they're making is actually the opposite of, of trust, locking things down, um, determining that, you know, people shouldn't have certain roles or be able to even create the knowledge. And I'm thinking that's what KCS is, right? It's not merely just letting agents or analysts get in and use the knowledge. It's all about, you know, their contributions and modifications and, and creating that knowledge as well. So trust is one of the ones that I actually see um, that organizations like they they say they want to do it but yet when they're you know push comes to shove and they're rolling it out trust does not um, actually <laughs> make it out right and it's one thing we have a lot of conversations about and the other one you know if I had to um, choose kind of a, a runner-up would be abundance and just thinking about you know it's one of the core principles or deep principles behind PCS is you know I commonly see you know just the comment me like we don't need x number of publishers and, you know, thinking, okay, so let's say we have, we have a hundred or a thousand agents. Well, we only need 10 or, or 20 publishers and regardless of what the numbers are. And I just like to get them to really start thinking about, you know, it's not about you needing a certain number of publishers, right? It's about what's the process that now happens when I've proven my capabilities in KCS, you know, you know, what I can do, you've seen the content I've created and what I contribute. And yet there's some you know, rule in place that doesn't let me actually move to the next level and become a publisher. So now there's additional work and cues and, and time, right, involved in terms of who has to now review what I've done and I'm capable at publishing content self-service, but not letting me do so because, you know, you've hit the limit of publishers, just for one example. So just wanted to um, just chime in on those two that I commonly see as well. I think that trust one is a really big one um, and mm -hmm. one I see a lot and it's such, you know, everybody believes in it in principle, but when it comes down to, okay, now we're going to give everybody access to create articles. They're like, oh, wait a minute. We didn't really mean everybody. We don't actually trust everybody. We really only trust some of the people. So let's mm -hmm. lock it down. And usually where I can win people over, especially, you know, this is a conversation that I'll have with management team as we're rolling it out to their team, where I can typically win them over as I say to them, you trust them to talk to the the clients on the phone. You let them answer that question without a review. So it's the same type of thing. All we want them to do is take what they're, what they're saying on the phone and put it into a knowledge article. And now the even better part is if they're giving out bad information, now we all know it. We can see it and we can fix it. You don't have that benefit when they're just sharing it in email or sharing it in a team space or they're you know, giving the answer to the client. So usually that's kind of an aha moment but I get from the managers of, oh, you're right. We're, you know, we trust them to take the calls by themselves. I mean, we can trust them and see what they're, they're actually putting in the knowledge base. Exactly. And that's, that's when I asked that question and I'm sure you've done the same. And it's like, there's, there's no logical response for it other than, oh my goodness, right. You're right. We've got to think about, you know, the whole trust component. We're trusting them to say it on the phone and actually fix the issue. And they're capable of, of doing so. So where did that trust end? Where was that, you know, where did that stop? Um, so Cheryl, you know, I know we mentioned buy-in before, right? So I wanted to kind of start with you on this in terms of, you know, getting buy-in. Was there a particular technique that you found, you know, most effective and, if, you know, whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, did you have any critics and, and, you know, how did you deal with those, those critics? Yes. Um, yes to all of that. <laughs> no, but um, one of the things that I found was effective, it's, it's um, and, and it, about getting buy-in um, and it, I, I call it the parent child scenario that uh, you could preach to your child and tell them, you know, 
this is the way this is. And until they hear it from someone else, they're just, they're just not buying it. Okay. Well, that's exactly the type of thing that I had run into one time. And so what I did was I actually shared with them other great webinars, like from the consortium, from the KCS Academy, from TSIA. And, you know, I'd pick one or two, like a subject that we had been, been working on. Uh, or discussing, and then I'd share that with them, and finally, it, uh, it, uh, actually, the person said to me, I'm finally drinking the Kool-Aid, Cheryl, (laughs) so um, it, it does, it really helps to see that there are other people that have tried this, it's not just Cheryl dreaming something up in her head, thinking that, you know, this is the way it should be, it, it, it does help to share the knowledge, so. I love that. Liz, did you have anything, you know, in terms of of techniques that that you found useful here as well? I think um, for me, some of it was just going back to the the idea of the strategic framework. And we took the goals that are put out there from our CEO that, you know, this is what we're going towards this fiscal year and tied to this is how KCS will help us get to those goals. And we went through that exercise as our program team and said, now we can take this back to every single department. So every department, what's your goals? Now let's talk about how is KCS going to help you get to those goals? So that really helps with people seeing the the value and how it can enable us to reach our goals because I think you'd be hard pressed to find a company goal that KCS can't help you get there. And it's not even, you know, it's not even trying to be that creative. Like, I don't know, I just, it will help you move towards everything. In, that you need to do within the company. I think that in terms of how do you deal with the biggest critics, for me, it's, I need to find out why they're the critic. It, what is it about it that they are hesitant? Um, lots of times what I find is that's going to be around compliance related issues. And they think that it's the wild, wild west and it's a free for all and everybody can do whatever they want. They just put out there what they need. And, you know, just explaining that we can absolutely have some controls over this. You know, it's not everybody puts out everything that they want and we just hope for the best, we can do some type of compliance control. So I think the more information we can give them about their specific concerns, not just in general, then that really helps. Yeah, I agree with Liz. Um, You know, understanding why is so important and it requires listening. And I I like the five whys technique where, you know, when you ask that question, um, why, and then they give you an answer, really listen to the answer that they're giving and then ask a more pointed why question against that response and get to the next layer of depth. Uh, Because a lot of times what they initially present on the surface isn't the whole picture of what the objection is. And so when you continue to ask why and dig a little bit deeper, you kind of get, you finally get to a place that you can respond in a way that really clicks with that individual and addresses their objection. Uh, one of the expressions that we often use in consortium circles is, you know, objections are a, a badly wrapped gift. You know, if somebody objects and they don't share that with you and they're silently sitting in the background and not adopting case yes, it can be difficult to address that. You don't know what, you may not know that the objection is there. You don't know what it is. So when somebody is vocal about their objections, you dig into that, you know, listen closely, ask those questions and Another thing that um, I know other people have experienced as well is oftentimes your biggest critics will become your biggest champions once you get them to flip. And so, you know, I had um, one customer success manager who she was told by her manager that she was going to, you know, she was going to adopt the knowledge base and, and, and use it every single day. And, you know, the, the, remo- the, the removal of that autonomy made her rebel. There's, you know, um, it's kind of a human instinct to want to fight back and regain autonomy. And so she refused to use the knowledge base after getting that directive. And one day, everybody was out to lunch and she couldn't shout over cube walls and she couldn't send an instant message. But she got so she got desperate and she went and searched the knowledge base and she came back and shared the story with me. And she ended up becoming one of, you know, uh, the, 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 the biggest champions of the knowledge base. I looked at her metrics month over month and they 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 shot up and, and, and they sustained. And so 
for some people like that, where she was just kind of sitting quietly in the background, sometimes it's just an organic thing that they're going to happen on, that's going to happen on its own. And that 10,000 pound flywheel, because KCS was working in the background all along and people were feeding new content into the system and improving the content. And so when she needed it, she went and did her search and there was a knowledge base article and uh, it, it saved her in that situation. Mm-hmm. We always shout those from the rooftop, too. Yes. So when people have success like that, we're going to tell everybody. That's right. Believe it or not, we're telling everybody. And yeah. if we can use their name, even better, because then it's, you know, this person it, that we all know didn't like it, <laughs> just yeah. had success. If, and if we can make them tell their own story, even better. Even better. Even yeah, better. Exactly. And the other thing with what um, Jacob was saying, anytime I do any type of presentation or training, especially with new teams that are coming on about what KCS is, how, how it works, all of those things, I always end with, why is, tell me why you think this isn't going to work. I want to get those objections out there right now, because if I don't ask, they're just going to leave the room and they're going to be talking about those anyway. And if they don't bring up anything, I will bring up some of the most common ones. Like, if you don't have enough time, it's one more thing, because they're absolutely thinking that. So let's just talk about them right now rather than, you know, have you leave and then it just festers. Yeah, I agree. You, you have to ask. Yeah. And I have even in, in the past gone through and looked at usage reports and found somebody that, you know, was excelling in one area. And then in another, maybe they were reusing and attaching articles all day long, but they were never creating anything. And I just pick up the phone and call them and ask them and say, hey, your reuse rate is really great. Like how it uh, would tell me more about what's working for you. And for people that aren't using the knowledge base, like what wisdom do you have that I can share with them based on your experience? And they're happy to talk about that. And then I'll kind of follow up with a question, but I noticed you're not creating what's going on here. And, and you, you know, you, you've listened to them, you've built some trust and, and then they're more inclined to share what their concerns are. And that allows you to, to, uh, uh, to kind of uncover what the issue is and address it. So I, it's just another example of, you know, what Liz is saying, you really have to ask your audience. It's so easy for us as leaders and operational types to get caught, you know, talking about KCS and making decisions at this level, but you've got to get really close to your audience here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All such great, great advice in terms of buy-in and sustaining it. And I love the strategy, Liz, with the training. Um, that's something that's one of the first questions I always ask when, you know, adoption just isn't there. Well, what was the feedback at the end of the training session when you introduced KCS? Well, I don't know. What do you mean? I said, was it positive? Was it negative? I don't know what questions were asked. Were there any that were veiled objections, right? Um, you know, were they kind of skirting around the, will I lose my job or we don't have time for this? Mm-hmm. Those were the most common ones we see. And most of the time they're like, I, there's no answer. There's, they're like, I just don't know. I said, well, we've got to go back and figure that out. Let's, let's, you know, like you said, let's get it out there. Let's work past right. it. Um, and Jacob, you mentioned objections, right? Perfectly, like they're just badly wrapped gifts. It's the perfect way to actually look at that. And, you know, I'll be honest, I did not at first look at objections as being badly wrapped gifts. And this was a conversation I had with Greg Oxton years ago. And, and he laughed at me because I said, you know, how do you do, how does Greg Oxton deal with this? You're, you know, do you, does it get you mad? Right. And I'd love to see you mad. And he's like, oh, you are looking at this from the wrong perspective. And, you know, as soon as he said that, I said, oh my goodness, we don't know unless if they tell us what they're saying to each other behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you have this pile on effect that happens where, you know, people trust their coworkers, right? Well, if they feel a certain way, maybe I'm wrong for trusting this. Maybe I shouldn't trust this. So let's get all of this right out in the open. Let's, let's work past it. Um, Absolutely. So I love the strategy there with building that directly into um, training, but getting into our next topic here, right? And Cheryl, I'll start with you with this one. So, you know, in terms of, you know, just really sustaining KCS, um, you know, is there anything in terms of, I, I know you, you know, started out with one group and we're rolling it out across many groups in the organization, but, you know, in terms of, you know, just that sustainability, was there something there, um, you know, that you could provide advice wise for companies that are looking to, you know, make sure that they have KCS running smoothly for the duration? I would say, Something that is just super key uh, for me is uh, KCS is a living and breathing thing and it needs to be nurtured. So coaching is so very important. Um, 
I would make sure that you continue to have continuous coaching. We all know we've, we've went through um, situations where there might be rolling out a new piece of software or, or maybe there's some sort of regulatory release going on and people are super busy. And so you don't have the normal processes of coaching taking place as they normally would. And over the years, I could see that having a great effect on the effectiveness of the KCS program. So I would say, make sure in order to nurture this KCS, I love that, that flywheel example as well, but mm -hmm. in order to make sure that it's running smoothly, that you continue to do coaching and um, take care of it. The other thing is uh, that, that on this same subject, different, different type of a, an answer here would be when you are setting things up, make sure you think about it down the road, a couple, two, three years later down the road. Don't just think about the now. Think about what's going to happen later, because some of those decisions that you're making now will affect how things will work later. Mm -hmm. So just, just another thing to, to keep in mind there. One of the questions that came in um, regarding measuring coach success, and I don't know if you had had incorporated anything like this at this point, but, you know, how do you actually, or are you, were you measuring coaches? Are you measuring coaches? What were the plans as far as that goes? And I would open that up to the panel as well. Yeah, um, just to take a stab at that first, what we did um, is, is we did uh, uh, work with the coaches on that where we had, we built a checklist. Um, you know, I mentioned the goals before about putting those goals in the knowledge workers um, performance objectives. Well, then what we did was we built a checklist for the coaches to use to help the coaches coach that knowledge worker to be successful with those with those um, goals. So then in turn, after we did that, then in turn, you could see how well that coach was doing. And over time, you could see okay, well, this coach found, you know, this person was having a problem with X, Y, and Z. And then here, you know, next month, that's all gone. He doesn't have that problem anymore. You know, so you could tell that it, it, it worked both ways. It not only helped the knowledge worker be successful to have a coaching checklist, but it also helped um, to see how effective the coaches were being as well. Just something we, we tried. I just thought I'd share. Yeah, you definitely want to uh, look at your license level promotions and make sure that people are advancing, you know, from candidate to contributor to publisher. And, and when coaching is effective, you know, adoption's taking off. It's not just about license level promotions, but that's a really good um, indicator, I think. In the chat, Robert Watson, I have to call this out because I love this quote. He wrote, coaching is the gateway to a successful program or program purgatory. So uh, yeah. that. absolutely right. Um, I remember hearing Greg say once that I've never seen a successful KCS program without a successful coach program. And that's really stuck with me. And when we moved to where we were implementing it in our service organization, that has been like the one piece that I thought we absolutely have to have strong coaches and we need to have enough coaches and get the right people and make sure that they feel like they're supported that they have the resources that they need and that, you know, if they have questions, so we've got program leads across our organization, but then, then they, in theory, should be working with our coaches, but they also have full-time jobs. So that's something that I'm very close to making sure that, you know, I'm nurturing the coaches and making sure they have whatever resources they need to, to be successful. Yeah, and no I argument think, there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, finish. No, that's, I was just going to say, I think that's where we've seen implementations, oh, implement, implement, big word, implementations <laughs> go wrong. And usually it's the coaches move to a different department or they leave the company and there's nobody else that's coming in. So it's, it's, they're taking the culture with them wherever it is that they're going because there's not someone else there to just kind of, it's not like it completely falls apart, but nobody's talking about it. Nobody's encouraging it the same way that the coaches were doing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Coaching is such a, so critically important. And I think another one of the quotes from the practices guide is along the lines of an organization's, you know, the, the, the return on investment that you get from your KCS program is directly proportional to your investment in coaching. And there's another quote that talks about that, but it's the speed of adoption and how fast you realize the return on investment. But, you know, there's, there's, so much in the KCS practices guide. And, and while I think if you're going to call out one thing, I think coaching is probably it. Um, if you skip any of the things, you're at risk of having trouble. And so it's it's getting executive sponsorship. It's establishing the strategic framework. It's building your KCS council, your communications framework, everything. What those different things look like from one organization to the next could be very different. And how I built a strategic framework in my last role was different because there was a organizational goal. It was a compound goal and five objectives that we could very easily map in addition to the business benefits, the benefits to the customer and the benefits to employees, that the goal and the objectives, we could map out how KCS lends itself to the organization realizing the goals and objectives. Here at PAR, that was really challenging with the stated goals, but what we found was that the company values, the first of which is speed. (laughs) Um, You know, it was really easy to map how KCS lends itself to an organization, uh, you know, being, being fast. And, and in particular in the support context. So again, the nuances might look a little bit different. There's a lot of freedom there. But if you skip out on executive sponsorship or a strategic framework, you're interjecting some kind of risk. Um, and the other thing that leaps to mind is, uh, you know, engage with that user c- community. So like we were talking about, um, make sure that when you build your KCS council, that you have representation from the front lines. That's such an important part of it to me. Uh, where I've seen KCS programs go off the rails, and this is pretty consistent, and um, is where it, it, it can become a victim of its own success. So I was on uh, a call a, a few years ago, and I was the third person introducing myself as um, new to a company rebooting a KCS program. And Greg Oxton kind of paused on that and said, you know, why are we seeing so many reboots? And the theme that we saw was, KCS becoming a victim of its own success. It becomes the well machine. That 10,000 pound flywheel is running. And then the person who leads the program leaves the organization. And the fact that things are on fire, that person, that role doesn't get backfilled, that 10,000 pound flywheel will sustain itself for a period of time. Uh, but eventually gravity sets in and things start to fall mm-hmm. apart. So you, you have to have a dedicated owner. I've even had people ask me, aren't you going to work yourself out of a job? Once you, you implement KCS, aren't you done? And, and the answer is no, because the environment's constantly changing and we need to adjust the program and evolve the program to, to uh, a, a, adopt to the changes in the environment. So having a, a dedicated owner is such a critically important piece of, of sustaining it in the long term. All, all great points there. I see that we're quickly running out of time here. So oh, well. <laughs> it's great. We can talk KCS all day, I know, <laughs> for sure. I brought the right people for that. Um, but one of the, the final questions that I have is if, if you have this one piece of advice you know, that you would give to other companies and hope and pray that they would actually follow or hear, right, above everything else. Um, What would that be? Liz, we'll start with you on that. Go to the practices guide. It's, it really is, whatever question you have, I don't know how to do this. I'm not sure what we should do next. It's in the practices guide. And I, I, you know, even after using KCS, following KCS for 14 years, I feel like I'm in there at least weekly looking for different pieces of advice. And um, when we follow what it suggests, we do great. When we decide, well, we're a little too different for that, that won't quite, for us, that won't quite work here, and we do something a little different, then we don't do so great. So <laughs> get into the I'd practice like, guide. I'd like to piggyback on that, Liz. Um, I, I heard something one time in a, in a webinar, and it stuck with me. It's follow the recipe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and if you've got a perfect recipe for chocolate chip cookies, this is what this gentleman was explaining, then you don't change that recipe thinking you're going to get the same results. Right. So follow the recipe. So I like exactly what you said. And, and um, it is so true. If you want it to be successful, follow the practice guide. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know I'm being repetitious here, but uh, I'll just point out, it was it was quite some time ago that Liz presented in the KCS in Action call. It was one of my favorite presentations, and she prefaced Thank it you. all by saying, those of you that have implemented KCS, I'm just going to tell you right now, none of this is going to come as a surprise because everywhere that we went wrong was where we deviated from the practices guide. And it's like I said, the the nuance of of the decisions that you make and how you do the things are going to be different from one company to the next. But where you skip out on an element uh, is where you're introducing risk Mm -hmm. in, in the success of your program. Absolutely. have a lot of great messages um, that have recently come in here. So just want to let you know, I've been trying to keep up with all of the questions that are coming in and asking the panelists as we see those. Um, For those, you know, if we didn't get to any of your questions, I will certainly reach out to the panel and get you responses. So don't feel like you won't be uh, uh, responded to. We'll certainly um, do that as well. But just wanted to just reach out and, and ask the panel, you know, any final thoughts? I know, you know, that that one thing, adhering to the practices guide, absolutely, completely agree with that. Um, but any parting thoughts? I think the one other thing that I'll add in is, and it goes back to kind of what Cheryl was saying earlier too, in terms of thinking long-term down the road is think big. So you're going to, you know, maybe you're starting out KCS. Typically it starts out in an IT service desk and you're thinking all about, you know, how it's going to work for us. Just assume it's going to go so well that the whole company is going to want to get on board because that's quite frankly where we are. You know, I have organizations that I'm not yet working with. I haven't approached them. They are approaching me. So, um, just assume it's going to go that well that you need to think about how do we scale this for the whole company. Don't try and do that when you first implement, but just think that we're <laughs> going to need to do this at some point. Yep, great advice, Liz. Excellent. And Liz, I would, I would definitely mimic that. Um, I love when we get to the point with organizations where that becomes the biggest problem is I have so many people, I've got a year long of, you know, mm-hmm. just the option and waves rolled out. Help. How do we do this? We can't tell someone you've got to wait a year to do KCS. They want it now. How do we do this? I'm like, well, that's a great problem to have. So let's figure that one out. But yeah, we definitely mimic that one as well. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. Armfin, did you want to take it back at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Again, thank you. This was a great session. So thank you, Michelle, for hosting this. And thanks to our great uh practitioners for all of your insights. So really appreciate that. And hopefully um, we can see you also next um, Tuesday. We're going to drill down on the coaching one. It's uh, We've talked about how critical it is to the success. So we're going to have three different coaching programs and uh, again, a panel on um, how to get started, ditches to avoid, as well as how to sell that value. And uh, so thank you again. That was tremendous today. So thank you so much to all of you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone.